Hi, this is Marshall Toplansky. And Joel Kotkin. And welcome to the Feudal Future podcast. If you're listening, it means you're interested in creating a better future, one that values diverse discussion and preserves opportunity for the middle and working classes. This is why we started the show, to bring together ideas and people that challenge the notion of a hierarchical, socially stagnant, and centrally programmed future. Maybe you've experienced the rising costs of home ownership, diminishing job prospects, or the burden of overregulation and increasingly censorship. This is happening in cities everywhere, and we recognize the need for new action. For this reason, we created the Beyond Feudalism Facebook group, a place for you to connect and share resources with like-minded people. Here you'll be able to ask questions, network, and share your own stories and ideas on how we can bring opportunity and common sense back into our civil discourse and governance. Consider this a hub for all things feudal, where we'll be sharing insights from our recent Beyond Feudalism report with Chapman University, clips and highlights from the podcast, and links to related content on topics such as housing, education, energy, transportation, and entrepreneurship. Much of our focus has been so far on California, but we expect to see this work and apply this work to conditions around the world. Well, as you can probably tell, we're not too excited about the path we're currently on as a society, but we are hopeful for what's possible. And if we can better understand what's happening and build momentum to overcome the trends, so much the better. So we encourage you to join the Facebook group via the link below to get involved and keep up-to-date information on all new developments. And for more information, my new book, The Coming of Neo-Feudalism, outlines everything that's happening and where we need to change. The link to that is also in the show description. So thank you very much for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the show. I mean, look at the Tax Foundation and what they say with respect to the business climate of California. It competes with New York or Illinois in terms of their tax structure with business climate. So California is in a world of hurt. This is Joel Kotkin. And this is Marshall Toplansky. And you're listening to the Feudal Future Podcast. Our society is being rapidly reduced to a feudal state, a process now being exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Millions of small businesses are near extinction. Millions more are losing their jobs, and many others will be stuck in the status of propertyless serfs. The big winners have been the expert class of the clerisy, and most of all, the tech oligarchs who benefit as people rely more on algorithms than human relationships. With this, around the world, the middle class is becoming more squeezed than ever. And it's having profound economic, social, and spiritual implications. Here on the show, we're having conversations with business, government, and citizen leaders like you to get to the core of these issues and explore how we can work together to form a better future than the one we're headed towards. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. Joel Kotkin. And we are just delighted to welcome to our podcast, Jay Garner. Jay is the chair of the Site Selectors Guild, which is the only professional association for site selection uh, in the United States. He's also CEO of Garner Economics. And today we're gonna talk all about how companies are going about selecting sites for their, for their expansions and, um, and all of the, the thinking that's going into that, especially given COVID. So I guess, you know, Jay, the first real question is, and it's pretty uh, definition of a softball, um, why, What's changed since the pandemic? Um, has the pandemic accelerated changes that were already happening, or is it something entirely new? 
Uh, Joel, I think it was a pivot. I think we went from a pause in March and April to a significant pivot and do things differently when the spigot turned back on with states opening up. Uh, as a result of that, what we did uh, pre-pandemic and what companies seem to be doing differently with respect to different industry sectors is changing significantly. Um, You've done a good deal of research on that. It might be worthwhile yeah. to just share our screen here for a moment and let our viewers look at some of the some of the um, insights that Site Selectors has. Uh, Jay, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so Marshall, what we did, so let me just tell you a little bit about the, the Site Selectors Guild uh, very quickly so that your audience will have a better feel for who we are. So there are 50 of us. We are peer selected location advisors, meaning we help facilitate location decisions of companies throughout the globe. And we, um, represent boutique firms like mine. My firm is based in Atlanta or um, uh, global firms like JLL or CBRE or Deloitte. And so we have a, a, a practice really globally. We have helped the last three years alone, uh, guild members have helped facilitate over $90 billion of capital investment globally and helped facilitate uh, over 161,000 announced jobs. Now I say all that to give you a background of who we are. In April, we surveyed our membership and we asked them, what are you hearing from your corporate clients? Because we represent large and medium sized companies throughout the globe. And basically uh, what we were hearing was that they were putting a pause or canceling projects. About 49% said that they were um, not continuing with projects, okay? So we resurveyed our membership in June because this we're This is June here? Pardon this me? One, this one is June? This one is June. Yeah. We're all trying to make decisions based on facts but the facts keep changing. Mm. So what we're seeing now is um, an increase of activity, global activity, to where uh, these companies are now moving forward with their projects. A lot of them are in manufacturing, food and beverage sector, which is what we do a lot of work in, um, life science, biotech, most of it as a related to the regionalization of the supply tra chain, trying to get reshoring from Asia, from China, back into the USMCA territory. So, so one of the, and, and I see here that um, people are predicting that the majority of the project af activity will, will uh, resume in 2021. So most people are, are still kind of um, uh, thinking that it's going to be relatively soon on, not waiting for years to do, to do these projects. Yeah, and, and we're gonna resurvey our members one more time uh, in September, and I guarantee you that will change too because uh, we're seeing a lot of requests for information from these companies saying, we want you to submit a proposal to help us. That spigot was completely turned off in March and April, and now it's, it's uh, turning on even more and more and so I think we're going to see an improvement still of that number. Well, you know, the thing that um, Joel and I have focused on in our work is the notion that people are going to be moving out of big cities and places where the costs are high to live into smaller mid-sized cities in the suburbs where people can afford to live. Are you right. finding that? Are you finding that projects are being considered for suburban locations and smaller areas rather than larger areas? Yeah, you know, so we started to see that trend before the pandemic. And I think it's been exasperated um, and accentuated now. If you look at that top right quadrant there, you can see where suburban areas, mid-sized urban areas, mm -hmm. rural areas are all the activity now and those large urban populations are, are, are seeing the brunt of it. 
there's a number of reasons for that. Besides cost, cost is a key. And obviously you have the older millennials now who um, are married, uh, uh, having children and they want to have space. But survey after survey that other entities do with companies and they ask them what's important to you in the site location project uh, process. When we ask about quality of place, the number one factor is public safety. And so what we're seeing now with respect to high profile locations, Portland, Seattle, LA, a little bit in Atlanta, New York, Chicago, the public safety is a key consideration. Interesting. Well, I see biotech, I see software, advanced manufacturing. Why am I not seeing California at all on here? There are lots of places besides Los Angeles um, that are safe in California. Well, yeah. Why is California not making the list? California, by and large, um, has had a history of having a perceived or real, depending on the um, uh, source that you want to use as not having a positive business climate, right? And I mean, look at the tax foundation and what they say with respect to the business climate of California. And um, it's either 49 or 50. It, it competes with New York or Illinois in terms of their tax structure with business climate. So California is in a world of hurt. Now, in my business sector that we do, we do a lot of the uh, food and beverage, you know, the Central Valley of California is the breadbasket of the US, right? But a lot of the commodity that's leaving California is going to get processed elsewhere because it's just a challenge to do business in that state. The regulatory environment is really a concern. Yeah, we've seen, um, you know, the research that we've done, uh, we just recently published our our um, report of beyond feudalism, we call it, um, which is looking at uh, trying to restore prosperity to the middle class in, in uh, California. Our research shows that California has lost more than 2000 business locations uh, in the past decade because of that exact issue. So yeah. we're, this is something that we're, we're interested in, but the thing that I find fascinating is that I would think that availability of talent especially in biotech and, and um, software, um, would at least put, put California on the list for consideration. But it sounds like it's not. Well, um, you know, look, look, let's look at Elon Musk, for example, and the argument that he's had with your state um, elected officials. He just said, screw it and said, because of the business climate, mean, I can find talent in Austin, Texas. Right. And he is, and he will. So same thing with Seattle. There's a, there's a clothing uh, company that makes non-woven fabrics called Buki. They've been there for 38 years. And when the Chop Chaz Zone uh, came up and they were right on the fringe of it, they said, we're leaving. They're moving to Texas. Uh, uh, do you have any, um, I'd be very interested in seeing anything about that, if you ha have it, the other group about that. Because, you know, we talk about COVID, but I think long-term, the civil disorder is, uh, may actually be worse, particularly what I wonder is, uh, and I've talked to business people who've left, let's say, Minneapolis. And yeah. what they say is, well, the problem is, what happens at the next incident? And the incident after that, and what happens if the if the cops are not there? I mean, in the history of cities, the first thing you need is security, and if you don't have security, you have nothing. Uh, Joel, you're exactly right. It's all about public safety. That's the reason why you know uh, in all of these surveys, not that we've done, but others, it's always been public safety, healthcare facilities. Then it's the quality of your public education institutions, mm -hmm. primarily K through 12. But look, I mean, the, the COVID is going to go away eventually it, from, from vaccinations or therapeutics. It's going to go away. But public policy shapes a community's identity for a long time. 
So do you think that Seattle and Portland, because these were cities that gained people from California because of costs, have, have they squandered the, their opportunity now? I, I think, you know, I was talking to a company the other day and, and um, uh, we're trying to win a project on a, on a major type of, of industry sector that I can't really talk about because of a non-disclosure, but they want to look west of the Mississippi. And they had a big X over Washington State, Oregon, and California. And they said, once we complete our transportation and logistics study, we'll have other states will eliminate, but these three states get eliminated immediately for that reason. The public safety. Well, just public policy, whether it's tax, hmm. whether it's public safety, whether it's regulatory environment, all that is driven by elected officials who don't really have the kind of business sense that say Texas or Arizona, you know, I'm not sure about Nevada now, um, but Nevada has been a net positive recipient of the California out migration. Yeah. You know, we're seeing, saw, are you seeing Utah also oh, in yeah. that area? I just pulled some da data from BLS and, and Utah on the percentage Utah is um, number one in um, net job growth, highest percentage job growth uh, year over year. So Utah, Nevada, Washington State, which is questionable now, Idaho, Texas, and then Florida, Arizona. Yeah, we did a we did some work looking at those at that BLS uh, number, and um, in the last decade, if you take 2008 to 2018 data, uh, and you look at it from a the from a perspective of high paying jobs. Yeah, Salt Lake City area had the highest increase in the country, up 708 percent. Wow! Over the course over the course of a decade, where it was up 30 percent ish in yeah. California in uh, yes. the, the, the L.A. area. So, Jay, so we we hear you. Is, what to what degree is um, housing cost an issue? Well, uh, obviously, when you get when you get out of California, my sister lives in, in uh, San Carlos, you know, which is a high housing cost area, obviously. So housing cost is a key consideration for everyone, but the big tech oligarchs that are just wealthy for doing anything at that company, you know, right, they can buy their way into anything. Sure. But here, yeah, this actually is, is, is what my question was, which is, this has been happening in energy using industries for quite a long time. Um, are you seeing a change in things like biotech and, because, you know, Marshall and I are sitting there saying, what the hell is California going to do? You know, we've lost the hospitality industry, which was very big here in Southern California, particularly. Um, are you seeing that even these very high-end industries, which California has historically dominated, is there a change in that as well? Um, it's starting to change, Joel. It's starting to change because the, the talent realizes they can go elsewhere and have a better quality of life. I saw a hilarious billboard uh, in the media last week that somebody erected in Texas. And it said, uh, and it was right around the time of the Tesla announcement. And it said, welcome to Texas. Uh, vote Republican. Remember what brought you here. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, they were saying, we don't want another California. You know? Right. So, so I, th I think... Um, are, you not, are you seeing any signs at all uh, uh, even like rear guard actions of parts of California starting to wake up to this? Are you starting to see people um, like, for instance, you know, in places like Orange County, which is much more conservative than the rest of uh, the rest of the coastal areas, are they coming in and saying, hey, wait, just wait a minute here. You know, we're, we're, we want to make it, we want to buck that trend. Um, I, you know, 
That's a great question. I don't know. Orange County portions of San Diego are clearly an anomaly for the rest of the state. Um, but because of that, there are also a minority. So does it really matter? All right. So they don't, they can't really affect state policy in a, in a reasonable they way. They sure can. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, so are a lot of the, are you looking at companies? I mean, is, would this also include the Googles, Apples, Facebooks of the world? Yeah. I mean, you know, Facebook, um, Amazon, and what Amazon is doing in Northern Virginia, um, all of them are doing locations in other states, obviously to spread spread the pie out. They're also, they wanna be able to have a positive impact with the various states' congressional delegations hmm. as they affect um, legislation, right? But all of them. I mean, you know, in the case of Google, here's a great, great example. Google announced they're not going to go back on their main campus in California until, what, uh, the summer of 2021. Right. That would never happen in, in a place like Texas, Georgia, where I am, you know. Um, so I, I, think, I think business climate is such an important key consideration to any location decision. Is, is that, um, but I mean, what I'm, I'm sort of most interested in is, is what the change has been. Oh. Um, and, and what you're saying is um, that also the reaction to the pandemic and, and what, what I'm wondering about in the long term, and you've been watching this for a long time, if um, if Google essentially lets people work remotely until 2021, does that change the whole supply chain? That I mean, yeah. um, I don't have to be there because I really don't have to be there? Yeah, well, it could. Here's what we think. Here's what we're hearing from our clients. When, and I say we, I'm saying the guild as a whole. So obviously, uh, with the pandemic and people working remotely, it's cost versus productivity. And, and so uh, initially what everyone was saying was that if productivity can remain equal or close to equal where it was before people started working remotely, then let's save a lot of money and continue to work remotely. Now, what we're hearing from these companies, and this is where the, the change occurs, whole, it's, it's costs plus productivity, plus the third one is creativity. And as you know, as demographers, uh, millennials, Generation Z people uh, love to socialize and to interact, and they feel that if the creativity can't be accomplished by working remotely, then they need to get back in the office again. So CBRE, uh, Colliers are both saying that for the next two years, you will see that remote consideration proliferate, but a lot of folks are saying enough of all of that, we got to get back into the creative aspect of socialization and working as a team. You know, it's, it's interesting for you to, to say that, and it's interesting to hear it, especially in the software industry, um, learning how to manage teams globally and remotely has become the norm over the past two decades, right? Yeah. So most software companies are constantly working with teams in Eastern Europe, teams in, in uh, India, teams in Asia. Um, do you think that the COVID experience that now requires everybody to work remotely will actually spill over into a world where what do I need an office for at all if I want to do if I want to do the kind of personal networking that you were talking about and the socializing um, it could either be done outside of office hours or through some virtual mechanism Marshall I think it's short term and short term is a couple of years and Long term, I think it's a long term play with the developers and uh, uh, office landlords that will not give up on space yet. Um, 
I, I saw a media alert yesterday that Facebook is acquiring lots of space in New York City. And when I first read it, I saw why. But they're figuring something out. And so I think it's a short term way to work remotely. Long term, we'll still work uh, socially. Well, it would seem to me that every estimate I've seen is we're going to go from 6% maybe to 20% re remote, which means obviously, you know, it's, that's a huge hit. And I mean, isn't there also going to be the effect of the fact that if you have socially distant office space, I could see where you could do a, you know, a one or two story suburban building where it's cheaper and you can make the space as opposed to a, I don't, I don't see the future of 60 story high rises if, unless you get rid of social distancing. Yeah. Well, social distancing will go away if we get the therapeutics and the vaccine. Um, the suburban locations are going to be the hot locations because of what you just said, lower profile, no elevators, you can walk. And so, you know, one story, two story, great suburban locations. That's, that's the short term play right now. And if we don't get an effective therapeutic or vaccine, then it's going to turn into a long term play. You yeah, see, actually, um, you know, this is somewhat on our feudal theme. I, I don't think that we're at the, you know, even if this pandemic is finally somewhat suppressed, A, I think there are going to be other ones. I just think that's the way it works in history. You know, it's not like you get one pandemic and then nothing, because the reasons for the pandemic haven't gone away. Right. The, 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 you know, I think that's one thing. And then I think there, there's just going to be a level of fear, some maybe perhaps irrational. Let's say we sort of get this under control and then we have a really nasty flu season. Mm -hmm. Under the current media environment and corporate environment, people are going to say, oh my God, we can't go have people come to work. I mean, how many of us who've been working at home said, God, I had a whole year with no flu, no bad colds. I mean, never got sick. But well, of course, you know, if I lived in isolation, I'm probably not going to get sick at all. So, right. I mean, I just wonder how much this is changing. Um, we're actually... Um, at Chapman, we're working with a major polling firm on how have the attitudes of millennials and Zs changed from the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, and fear, obviously, is going to continue to drive um, how we conduct business. Right. Yeah. Yes. And, and also, you know, to your point, Joel, an uh, interesting article came out today about um, uh, the latest census and millennials and the younger generation are now actually the majority right. demographic group in the country. So we really do need to pay attention, not just to what where the money was going to drive them, which is what you do with, um, with site selectors, right? You're obviously working with large companies that have a lot of money invested in it, but you are, we're going to have to pay attention to these consumer trends. The thing that hits me about what you just said before though, Jay, that I, it just resonates so much with Joel and I and our thesis about California is that if the tech oligarchs themselves, that, that this is the group that basically props up California. Right. It is the group that's the, that is funded progressive politics in California that has led to these policies. If they're abandoning the state and maybe abandoning is too dramatic of a of a statement, but they're certainly using you to look elsewhere. Um, what does that mean for the future of California? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. It, it, it's a great question. There, there will be at some point, there will be a reckoning. I mean, California is still uh, quite a place. It's one of the largest economies. If you extract it uh, on a global basis, there are plenty of positives about California, but uh, policies that affect business uh, can be better. Yeah. Well, what, what we see is that for people of our generation who bought homes when they were affordable and are already established, it's much easier than if you're a young. I mean, I would imagine that some of the Z's may stay, although most of my students, when I talk to them, I say, Where are you going when you graduate? I'm astounded. How few I 
I moved to California in 1971. In, in that time, nobody left. It was always people coming here, but you didn't leave unless, you know, something pressing happened or you got a great job somewhere. Um, that doesn't seem to be likely in, in, the, in the coming years. I mean, it, it's, uh, so you have this, comp, you know, in here in Southern California, we have this, what we came up with was lo relatively low wages and very high prices. That's probably not the best combination. Where are your students saying they want to go when they graduate? Um, and uh, Marshall may have a little bit different than me, but I find Arizona, Texas, Tennessee, um, uh, still some to Washington State, although not Seattle, but the other parts of Washington State, um, Utah. Um, I mean, again, the, the Mormon issue is probably the biggest, you know, detriment in many ways there, uh, just because some people don't want to go to a Mormon state. But uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, almost never do you hear, oh, I want to move to New York or Boston or... Right. And, and um, you would think, you would think like in my particular area, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, on the faculty of the business school at Chapman, you would think that New York, um, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, uh, Dallas would be, or Chicago, where, where the finance industry is, where the where the growth industries are uh, from a, um, you know, from a, a software point of view, you would think that would be the place. And no, actually, most people don't want to. They, they, and they don't want to stay here because they recognize that they really can't afford to live here. But, you know, the idea of going and being a Google surf and living in your car, <laughs> getting free food, you know, getting access to that gym so that you can kind of clean yourself up even if you do live in the in the car, you would think that that would be very attractive to people, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> they're, 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 um, I'm hearing that quite the opposite. People want to just go someplace where they can afford to live and where the business community is very robust. Yeah. Now, whether they're going to go to your list that, I, that you had put up earlier um, for site selection of like Indianapolis or Des Moines or Columbus, Ohio, or places like that. I don't know that our students know enough about that to be able to make an informed decision, but um, certainly there are places that they can afford to live. Well, so that list, remember, are what we consider second tier cities like Huntsville, Alabama, you know? You mentioned uh, Tennessee and, and it's, it's a great point. Tennessee is a great product in the site selection uh, mm. section. Nashville has a wonderful buzz to it, both on the music scene and on the on the tech scene. But um, to your point, and this is one of the things that I think you might have wanted to talk about too, the ability for people to get uh, a tuition-free Community college or technical school education is a big plus, and Tennessee offers that with a couple of their programs, including what they call Tennessee Reconnect. Those are people who have been out of the workforce for years. They've gone back in the workforce. They may be in their 40s or 50s or 30s, and they're getting uh, tuition-free education in tech school or in community college. And I, I mean, I know that you guys are in a four-year institution, but I have said that in uh, a lot of the sectors that we work with, community colleges have been the unsung heroes in workforce training for years, and they've just gotten recognized in the last couple of years. Yeah, you know, we, we totally agree with you, and, and there's such a skills shortage in um, traditional trades, for instance, that um, where education is really not happening, certainly not in California, although in places like Long Beach, which Joel right. and I visited uh, recently, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing programs that are collaborations between industry and the public two-year college and four-year college groups, as well as even high school, to try to provide that conveyor belt of training in order to be able to um, create a pipeline to work. Yeah. Well, I mean, part of it seems to be that California in particular doesn't thinks that blue collar, even high skilled blue collar jobs are beneath them. 
And, you know, we don't want to do, you know, these tests, even though they may be the way that working class people become middle class. That's our biggest issue in feudalism in California is we've got this very high end that's, you know, the richest people in the world. And then we've got this gigantic underclass and a working class that is get, getting poorer and a middle class that's disappearing. Mm -hmm. And our campaign is to try to reverse that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's create AI. Let's create AI to get rid of most of the jobs and then starve out all the people that are doing vocational work. So we really have nobody left. It's gonna solve, it'll totally solve the pollution problem and the uh, and climate problem, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a Pollyanna way to look at it, right? Well, of course, what happens is the people move and their emissions go up actually because they, they're in a place where, it, you know, right. like if you live in, in coastal California, you don't use a lot of energy for, uh, for heating or cooling. Yeah. But if you move to Houston, you do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you have a good point. So I, I spent some time in Twin Falls, Idaho. They have the largest berry cluster in the United States with a location quotient, about 45. Okay. So everything from yogurt to just the milk that you drink comes out of uh, Twin Falls, Idaho. Beautiful place. They embrace they strongly embrace the blue collar mentality. Hmm. And so I see a lot of those around the country, honestly. Um, and I, I hear exactly what you're saying in places like Seattle or Portland or parts of California. Yeah, yeah and, and I think what you've got is you've got, you know, I mean, I think coming out of the pandemic, there have been two things that have survived, the high end, software and the people who provide basic stuff mm -hmm. and you can't do the basic stuff in california and you can't do it in new york and if if there's a movement of some of the high end elsewhere then that's pretty catastrophic yeah, yeah. oh those pesky people you have mm -hmm. to do something with them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i know it, it's such an odd world and we're you know i think about what we're teaching our students you know we're teaching our students that um if you're not participating in this next wave of the fourth or fifth revolution, depending upon how you how you count it, of of AI and information, well, you really, you know, you're not going to be a functioning member of society, and nothing could be further yeah. from the truth, you know. Well, Jay, it has been such a pleasure getting your perspective and. Um, hearing what is really going on in the minds of corporations in terms of their locations. I just want to thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. It's my pleasure. Uh, one thing I should probably say, so I don't get in trouble. So that, that infographic that you had up there was um, uh, representative of the guild, but uh, the comments that I share and my opinions were mostly my opinions, not necessarily the guild. Right. So I have to do a disclaimer. You're covered. Okay. You're covered. Consider yourself. Consider yourself covered. Okay. And thank okay. you. Thank you again for um, joining us at the Feudal Future podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you all for having me. Okay. Take care.